Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. It's always uh, tough to follow Anne because she's so good at both thinking about things and synthesizing them. And I feel like in hindsight uh, and in comparison, I babble a little bit, so I will try not to um, and kind of discuss the... So I want to talk a little bit about the role of gender in security, and it's something that I've been thinking of kind of over the long term uh, and so I guess I have a couple of insights that I think are general and then ones that I think are changing a bit. Um, so about 15 years ago, I wrote a piece that made the argument that there are three important ways to understand gender in security. Uh, now I think there's more than three. But I'm going to tell you about the first three, uh, and then I'm going to tell you about a few things that have changed since then. So I made the argument that gender is important in conceptualizing security, that it's important to understanding causes and predicting outcomes, and that it's a key part of any solution to a security problem. Um, so I'm gonna talk about all three of those briefly um, to give you a sense of what I meant by them. So when I say it's important in conceptualizing security, I mean that when you think about gender, when you use a gender lens to think about security, you see different things than you might see if you neglected concepts of gender. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the things that I've thought a lot about is if you flip the question, what does it mean to be secure into the question, what does it mean to be insecure? Which of course in theory should be a direct opposite that actually evokes completely different imagery for most people who hear those two questions. Uh, it brings, what a lot of feminist scholars have done good work about, which is showing that there's a spectrum and a continuum of violence, not just uh, in the international arena, but around global politics more generally. So Chris Cuomo made the argument that war doesn't start and end, uh, that instead there's a continuum of violence among states and in the international arena. And there's also been a lot of work on if you look for where women are and where gender is, you see that there's not some big break between international violence and violence that isn't international, but instead there's kind of a spectrum that helps us understand security as both broader and deeper than some of the mainstream approaches to studying international relations might seem and also to the ways that it's used in the policy arena sometimes. Although, um, as Anne noted, there's a lot more kind of movement on these issues in the policy arena than there is sometimes in scholarly IR. So a broader and deeper understanding of what it means to be secure, and more importantly to me, what it means to be insecure. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say is that I think gender is key to understanding causes and predicting outcomes in the ways that security functions. Um, so the ways that, that I'm sure Cynthia will talk to you about militarism will demonstrate this uh, pretty strongly. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of uh, examples in gender scholarship and IR where you really can't understand what went wrong or what went right or how something happened in the security arena without understanding the ways that the gender dynamics happened. Um, so one of the kind of first books I read that taught me about this, and it's still one of the better books I've read that taught me about this, is Catherine Moon's Sex Among Allies, which explains that you can't understand the macro political relationship between the United States and South Korea without understanding the role that individual camp town prostitutes' lives had on, in that relationship. And that you then also couldn't understand individual people's lives within this dynamic without understanding the macro political dynamics. And that that all had an axis based on gender. So you can't understand what's going on pretty frequently in security unless you ask yourself questions about women, gender, and sexuality. So then the third part is that it's a key part of solving security problems. So if something isn't working in the security sector and you want to make it work, uh, then I think that that's something that you need to ask questions about gender to do. 
And there are two things uh, that I want that I'd point out that I thought were really good at this in terms of explaining it. One is Laura Shepard's very detailed work over a very long time on the women, peace and security agenda that talks to us and tells us why if you don't understand the gender dynamics of the constitution of not only international organizations, but also security, you won't understand why some things in the WPS agenda work and some of them don't and how to make the ones that don't work work or understand why they couldn't. Another piece that was pretty useful for this is Megan McKenzie's work on disarmament, demobilization and reintegration processes, where she talks about the ways in which gendered assumptions are made about former soldiers. And when those gendered assumptions are incorrect, they result in a dysfunctional DDR program that doesn't actually decrease the likelihood of returning to conflict. So those are kind of the three big things that I originally saw being important in gender and security. And then I'm gonna kind of close my discussion with a few more ideas that I would add to that now with a little bit more kind of hindsight and view in the field. Uh, the first is that uh, as feminists, we've always talked a lot about positionality in security uh, and particularly the ways that the way that you're, where you are located uh, on a wide variety of axes around the world actually matters in terms of how you see and interact with security. I think that that took a long time to become, in my view, equated with a decolonial and intersectional approach to thinking about sex, gender, and race and global politics. But I now think that you can't ask questions about gender and positionality in global politics with also, without also asking how gender is raced and race is gendered. Um, so I think that thinking about gender and security is also a commitment to intersectional thinking about positionality and the ways that security and insecurity are not just gendered but raced. In addition to that, it's really important to talk not just about gender, but about sex and sexuality. Uh, so pretty often we talk about gender and we talk about the ways in which sexualities may be gendered. Um, but often the sexuality is a predicate uh, to thinking about uh, gender insecurity. But more recently, there's been a lot of work about the ways in which sex and sexuality themselves are constitutive of security situations and therefore need to be kind of thought of uh, in terms of their own contribution in addition to in terms of their view of gender. Uh, so right now I'm writing a book on uh, treaty marriage transfers of territory, which have a gendered story and a story about sexuality, but they also have a story about sex and sex acts. Um, and thinking about how that interacts in security is I think pretty important. Um, and then kind of the last point that that I'll kind of close on is that I think that the theory and practice worlds uh, we so often kind of think about now in academia as separate, where you do research and then depending on your national context, that research has impact. And those two things can kind of get separated and thought about differently um, in different ways. Uh, but I think that one of the things that's really important is that when Anne's talking about the history of studying gender and international relations, one of the key things that made the field just so cool as it got started was that it was never in this ivory tower outside of thinking about impact. Um, and somehow in some ways it kind of got moved into that. And I think now it's moving back out a little bit. But I think that Marisha Zalowski one time characterized theory as practice itself. Um, which I always thought was kind of a really good way of thinking. Yes, there are moral implications to everything I say and do, even if people never listen to it. And then above and beyond that, people do listen to it. Um, and there is a kind of back and forth between scholarly theorizing about gender and security and then what states do and what non-state actors do and what NGOs do. So thinking about how we study gender and security as related to how gender and security are associated or thought through in the policy world is really important. And at least for me and my work on women's political violence, there are times in my career when I kind of forgot government reads this. 
scarier than that, militaries read it. And even scarier than that, intelligence reads it. Um, and when you forget that, then you can kind of detach your studying of the ephemeral nature of sex and gender from what happens to real people. But I think that at its core and at its strongest, the study of gender and security is the study of gender and real people's security. Um, and that's an everyday practice in addition to a theory. So I think that I've taken my time um, and will be quiet now.